On today's episode of Locked on Wilds, Joey Erickson at Locked on Stars wants to know what to think of Matt Dumba in Dallas. I'll tell him. Your Locked on Wild, your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another special crossover edition for what I believe is the third time we have done one together. Locked on Stars and Locked on Wild. Seth, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. How have you been? How has the offseason treated you so far, my man? Well, it's interesting because for the first time in my you know adult working career on the uh, on the job hunt. And so mm-hmm. it's been a much less... It's been a much less busy summer than I uh, am used to, but in some ways it's been way more busy. Mm -hmm. So it's been an interesting kind of transition towards what comes next. And honestly, it's a perfect parallel to where the Minnesota Wilds (laughs) are at is we are kind of going to see this transition between what is currently taking place with this wild team and where they would like to get to. Yes. And so transition i think is the uh i think that's the perfect operative word for uh for where i'm at and where the minnesota wild are at too so I, i'm glad we're both going through this at the same time <laughs> yes i have uh, i have plenty of questions about that minnesota wild transition we'll get into i'm sure you have plenty of questions for me and my dallas stars and can't wait to to dive into a little bit of everything on today's crossover episode should be a ton of fun i'm gonna get the hardest question out of the way seth how happy are you that Ryan Suter is now being paid by multiple teams within the Central Division? <laughs> Please, you have the floor. <laughs> oh, it's cra- it's crazy that we have gotten to this point and that it is a third Central Division team. And you know, you are in a uh, you are in a rare position to be able to uh, kind of piggyback off of what I say next because obviously we know the first buyout for Ryan Suter was motivated more by some of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes. I feel like it's safe to say the second buyout was related way more to what was happening on the ice. Yes. And so you've got Suter now being paid by the wild, being paid by the stars and going to the St. Louis blues. And I don't know about you. When I heard St. Louis was the team I was like, huh. You had to feel a bit odd. It's just, it, it feels like a weird fit, not only for Ryan Suter, considering who's already on that blue line for St. Louis, but also where the St. Louis Blues are at. Like, Ryan Suter's getting up there in age. Oh, he yeah. He has maybe, I don't know, based off of the contract that he got from the Blues, this might be it for him. And so you would think that he would want to hop into a team that is legitimately going to contend for a Stanley cup. But you look at some of those teams that are going to be doing that. And I just don't know if there's a roster spot for a guy like that. who doesn't really offer you a ton. And I don't know. It just, it feels like there were, um, it it just feels like there were some, other spots that maybe he yeah. could have uh, gone to. And I don't know the fact that it was a central division team, I think is a message at both the stars and the wild, but weird fit to yeah. say the least. Yeah. I-, I never thought he was going to have much of an issue finding a- another opportunity. I-, I think a lot of teams could use a 39 year old defenseman to just plug into their system. And the great thing about Ryan Suter this past season at least for Dallas's sake was he wasn't playing in the top four. They were finally able to get him into that third pairing, which actually was a nice fit for him. And I never had many concerns about Ryan Suter during his time here in Dallas. There was some obvious weaknesses. He wasn't as mobile as he once was, but I think he got a a lot of flack for what I think was more of Dallas's fault than his own because Dallas necessarily wasn't putting him in the best situations to be successful. Obviously, playing with Miro Haskin is going to help you out, but it also sort of forced Miro to have to elevate his play or 
at least have to do a little bit more in order to cover up for Suter. This past season with the emergence of Thomas Harley really, really benefited the Dallas Stars. You could put Harley and Haskin in together, and then Suter could just be on that third pair, and you, you kind of forget about him. And he was really, really good for most of the postseason, and he was the prior year as well. It was just the Western Conference Final, which was his demise in both of those series. And uh, a lot of that is due to Dallas didn't have a lot of options this past year on the back end. If if you recall, they were running five defensemen for the majority of the postseason. Then they finally found Petrovic, and that sort of worked, but Edmonton was just way, way too much for the stars to handle, unfortunately. And yeah, Ryan Suter's 39 years of age at the end of the day. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's an old man you're trying to, to try it out there and um, to get valuable minutes off of. So I, I just wanted to hear your take on <laughs> Ryan Suter since uh, <laughs> we, uh, we certainly can, uh, can relate uh, to that. All righty, let's, let's transition into the Minnesota wild. I, I want to hear about post Dean Evason. I want to hear about this past regular season from what I was kind of picking up. You were sort of on the, you were on team tank a, a bit, get the best draft pick possible because the wild were, I guess in my words would have been consistently inconsistent. And that can be very, very frustrating. And it can also tease you a bit when they go on some runs and they, and they keep it within distance of making the playoffs. Obviously they came up a, a bit short this year. Um, yeah. Take the floor. How would you describe this past season of Minnesota Wild history? <laughs> uh, a roller coaster, to say the least. And I'm not talking about a roller coaster that operates under its normal conditions. <laughs> I'm talking about a roller coaster that maybe breaks down oh, or speechless. doesn't get up to the top of the hill <laughs> and then is like, oh, well, now we're going to go backwards. Like it was just, it felt like three different seasons um, all in one. Because, you know, the it's, it's amazing that the, the Sweden trip was actually still this past season, too. That feels like yeah. a season in and of itself. Then you have the slow start with Dean Evason being let go um, because the team just could not. They just could not get any footing in the early part of the season. It was goaltending. It was special teams and just not a great mix. And so then John Hines comes in and like you said, the team goes on a run. I think tease is the perfect word because at the end of the day, they beat the teams below them in the standings, but Dallas, Winnipeg, Colorado, uh, even Nashville, you throw them in the mix too. one win against those teams. Uh, oh, wow. it, it, that just is not going to get it done, which is why I was of the belief that it was a situation in which you may want to try to get a look at what you have that is coming next. But the Wilds continued to battle. They fought all the way to the end of the year. They found some things out. They figured out a couple of things that I think are intriguing going forward. John Hines uh, employed the Kirill Kaprizov, Matt Boldy, Jewel Erickson Eck line combination mm -hmm. from February 7th to basically the end of the year. And it was one of the best lines in hockey. And so it wasn't a season in which you didn't get anything figured out. It just was a season in which it felt like the wild were good enough to beat teams below them in the standings, but they were not good enough to beat the teams above them. And if you're going to be a playoff team, you got to beat the teams below you in the standings, but you have to at minimum be able to hold your own against those teams above you and you know the better playoff team you are the more able you are to get those wins against those teams and it just never happens this past season and so we go into the final year of Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter um kind of holding over this team <laughs> with uh with mm -hmm. the dead cap hits we go into this year with much of the same because there really wasn't flexibility to make a ton of moves this offseason. They did bring in Yakov Trenin, but beyond that, it's pretty much the same team. And the uh, the hope is a better start this year, which if you go better than 5-14, and 14, you put yourself in a better position yeah. to make the postseason. But as we'll talk about more later in the show, it feels like pretty much all the other teams in the Central Division got better. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can make the case for 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 most of them. Um, I, I don't know if I necessarily put Dallas in, into that conversation, but 
they didn't necessarily get worse in, in a lot of ways. I, I am curious when you say you learned a few things. If, if I had to assume, would that be Brock Faber is an absolute stud? And you're starting to see Marco Rossi sort of figure it out. And that's a really, really good thing for Wild fans. Yeah, that those were two of the biggest, most pleasant surprises of the season. We got a little taste of it. Uh, last year for Brock Faber and in the postseason against the uh, the Dallas Stars. Yeah, uh, he put it on full display this year. And the craziest part about it, and which is why I'm still just furiously bitter that he did not win the Calder <laughs> Trophy. He played the final two months of the season. Had no every chance, Seth, man. That was Connor McDard's ward all the way. Come on. <laughs> we all knew that. <laughs> I, I know, but I'm still I'm still going to reserve Fair my enough. right to be yes. upset. Um. <laughs> Faber played the entire final two months of the season with broken ribs. He didn't miss a game. He played, you know, he was playing upwards of 25 minutes a night. He was playing on the power play, playing on the penalty kill. He was the top option defensively for the wild. He didn't miss a beat. And so you see a guy who's capable of doing all of these things. You factor in the fact that he was significantly hurt. There's no way you don't come away just amazingly impressed with what he was uh what he was able to do and you talked about Marco Rossi too um one of only two players on the team him and Faber that played every game the entire season all 82 they were the only two guys to do it and Rossi after a uh slow start to his career that 19 game sample size two years ago that uh resulted in him having one point and being sent back down to Iowa that's a distant memory and now the question is like, well, geez, if we can get if we can get a couple of better players on the line with him, all of a sudden you're looking at a guy that is a, you know, top six staple in this lineup. And so those were definitely two of the big surprises. And we uh, we learned that those two are here to to stay mm. from an uh, NHL perspective. Um, and so that you know, like I said, it wasn't a year in which we just kind of ad advanced the calendar. There were still some things to take from this uh, this year that uh, definitely are important going forward. Yeah, it, it's huge. And Faber made an immediate impact since leaving the University of, of Minnesota. He, he stepped right in and uh, was ready for this challenge. And it, it's also a good thing because with the the cap situation and dealing with Parise and Suter, you need some of these young guys to, to pan out. So when you do have the cap space and mobility to go get guys, now you can start building around these young studs like Faber and Rossi. So I think the future is still very, very bright, but at the same time, they still have a chance to compete, man. <laughs> uh, they, they still have a, a chance to compete. And, you know, speaking with Anne yesterday on, on Locked On Preds, uh, one of the things she sort of pointed to was it was pretty big for Nashville to at least get into the postseason because they have some young guys that haven't had that experience. And now you bring in the Stamkoses and the Marsha Sos who are serial winners. So they already have a taste for it. And that's something you can work with. And uh, maybe Minnesota can do that here um, uh, in the next couple of years. Maybe they want a 35 year old Jamie Ben. I don't know. He's a, <laughs> he's at the end of his contract next year, but <laughs> um, may have to, uh, may have to come back to that one at a later date. <laughs> Anyways, let's uh, let's move on to uh, some more stars and wild discussions. They had to head matchups for next season. And what does the future look like for Dallas and Minnesota? We'll do that in just a moment. Today's episode of Locked on Stars and Locked on Wild, the special crossover edition, is brought to you by FanDuel. We all love sports. We love them so much, and you never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get such fewer games, and the sports aren't sporting like we want them to. But FanDuel lets you keep all of the sports going wherever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. It is free and available on your smartphone. It takes 30 seconds. Go to the Google Play Store. Go to the App Store and download FanDuel. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. We're in the dog days of summer. Major League Baseball is in full swing. Minnesota Twins are doing their thing, trying to get back into the postseason and make a splash. Not so much for the Texas Rangers, even though they're still fighting. They may be sellers at the deadline, but they're pushing as well. So head over to FanDuel and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. 
So you did touch on it a bit, but I did want to ask you on the Minnesota Wilds off season. Not a whole lot, pretty pretty quiet for the most uh, most part. But Yakov Trenin was one of the big acquisitions at four years, three point five million dollars. What do you make of Trenin, the player, and how do you like the fit? And does it look like he could maybe help that PK that's been a bit of a, an issue over the past few seasons? Uh, you know, it is interesting because I have, based off of previous moves, tried to take more of a like case by case basis approach yeah. to uh, to particular players. And I like Trennan. He is, from what I've been told, just a complete bulldog. And he, I think, will help on the penalty kill for sure. The problem, though, is that it feels like the Minnesota Wild have a few of these guys that are all just the same sort of players, the identity guys that can help you out on the penalty kill. They're not going to score a ton of goals, but they're physical. And I feel like you should have a more limited number of those guys, as opposed to making them a focal point on your lineup, because every team in the NHL, for the most part is, uh, is trying to prioritize speed and skill but also having the ability to play physical when necessary. And it feels like the Minnesota Wild are kind of running opposite of that, where they play physical, and if needed, they can play with speed and skill. But the problem is, is you need that every game. And so it would be, if I was putting a roster together, I'd be looking more for the speed and skill guys. Now, this is where the prospects come in, we hope. But... um it, it just it felt like Bill Guerin felt like he couldn't do nothing. And so he goes out and gets a guy in Yakov Trenin that should help with what they're looking to do. But like I said, it feels like you've got three or four guys that fit this exact mold. They just haven't been able to do their thing at the level that they should. So it's a move by itself. I I don't have a problem with. Maybe a year too much for me, for my taste. And, you know, three and a half million, that could be another discussion too. Mm -hmm. But it just feels like one of those things where it's like, you see that meme of, hey, mom, I want such and such. And, well, we have such and such at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I want Yakov Trenin. Well, we have Yakov Trenin at home. <laughs> we have three of them, actually. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's kind of my thoughts yeah. on that. But it does feel like Bill Guerin kind of thought, well, I, I can't do nothing. That's a... That's a great way to put it because I, I think Jim Nill felt a little of the same way when July 1st was rolling and they weren't able to go out and get some of those big fishes possibly like the Matt Roy's of the world, the Brandon Montours, which they would have never been in the same stratosphere of, of some of those deals, even though the Roy one wasn't, um, wasn't in particular too crazy of a, a deal term and, and money wise, and I think that's why they sort of went into panic mode and they just went out and sort of cleaned up the other right shot defensemen that were on the market in Matt Dumba and Labushkin and Brendan Smith, who are, are, are okay players. It just, I think it was below the expectations of what many Stars fans had, including myself. I was hoping for a bit of a splash to try to replace Chris Tanev who was wonderful here in Dallas. And I, I think that meme can sort of be thrown back on the stars. And, well, we had Ryan Suter. Why would you buy out Ryan Suter to go sign Dumba and Labushkin? Where it's like, well, we kind of have that at home to, to some degree. But I am curious, and, and I have to ask you about, about Matt Dumba, because he really found himself in Minnesota and sort of played his prime years with the wild what is dallas getting in matt dumba i'm not necessarily in love with the player and i'm certainly not in love with where they're going to have him and that's going to be in the top four playing quality minutes but if i if i asked you from an unbiased perspective what is the ceiling you could possibly get with dumba and what do you think his floor is right now because he still is relatively young in hockey years at, at 30 years of age you know it's interesting because the player that was drafted by the Minnesota Wilds, uh, that Matt Dumba, was one who was way more of an offensive defenseman than uh, 
than a defensive guy. And he was always known for his shots. He was great on the power play. But obviously, um, and I forget which Kachuk brother it was, but there was a fight uh, between him and one of them in which his uh, he tore a pec muscle and his career just completely flipped after that. He, yeah. he, his shot wasn't the same. He wasn't able to uh, produce at the uh, the same level that he did previously. And it, it was a very high level of performance that uh, that he was able to bring to the table. He had at one point, um, I think it was something like 14 goals in 30 games in one season. Uh, so a guy that's really capable of yeah. uh, of putting up some uh, some high point totals, but just he just has not been the same guy since that injury. And we saw it in Minnesota near the end of his tenure is a guy who I think figured out the other way to be an NHL defenseman um, by being, you know, more of a physical guy. And obviously that was seen in the series against the Dallas yeah. stars from, uh, from two seasons ago. But you, you see what he did with, uh, with Arizona and then Tampa Bay this past season. And it's just a guy that I think is still kind of trying to figure out. Yeah what he is now he we got a little taste of it but i think he's still trying to figure out how to do that over the course of a full 82 game season um with the defenseman that dallas has obviously you've got some uh, some really good top end guys so it's a possibility where i think he can be sheltered much mm -hmm. like he was here in minnesota being longtime pairing partner with jonas brodeen who's one of the best yeah. there is. So he was able to, to shelter those defensive deficiencies, but you know, much like Suter, the, the offensive upside just really isn't there anymore. Yeah. And so it's all about what he brings to the table defensively. And if he can figure out how to, uh, how to just, you know, not be a liability defensively, it's uh, it could work. Yeah. I, I'm hoping he, he does find his, his game a, a bit here and I'm trying to save, some of my crit critiques for when the season begins, because who knows, yeah. it could be a, a, a really, a really nice fit, but he has gone into some penalty trouble after the last few seasons. I think he's had over 80 minutes the last three years, um, but also where he was playing in, in Arizona, some other places uh, that that could change here in Dallas. It's obviously a much better environment for him to be successful. Um, I don't necessarily love him probably being in in the top four. But as you mentioned, if you pair him with a Harley or Haskinen, it, it may shelter him a bit and maybe turns out to be a really nice player. And then, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, eating, eating crow a bit, which um, I would certainly, certainly love to do. <laughs> and um, Dallas can be in a position to, to make a, a, a deep playoff run. I, I guess re where really my, my frustrations lie is it just doesn't feel like Dallas got over the hump. It just doesn't feel like these were the acquisitions to to get them over the hump of the Western Conference Final. And I still think they're a trade deadline um, away from doing that, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You position yourself and then you go find a, another Chris Staniff. Um, and then maybe you're um you're feeling pretty good uh about where you lie. What 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 does the the near future from your perspective look like for the the while? Because there are a lot of great pieces. Kareel's gonna do his thing. Boldy is a heck of a player as well uh, down the middle. Um, what does it, what does it look like for Minnesota? And are you, uh, would you say you're, you're pretty bullish on their, on their chances the next, what would you say? Five years of kind of getting back in the mix. I I'm bullish on their chances long-term, but uh, there is some work that needs to be figured out between now and then, particularly on offense. Cause it's a team that, you know, once you once we saw that uh, Jewel Erickson, Ak, Kirill Kaprizov, Matt Boldy combination, the rest of the scoring in the lineup just just vaporized. And yeah. so it's a team that needs just some young pop that can be added into the lineup, similar to what the Stars got with uh, Logan Stankoven, and you know even going back a couple of years, Wyatt Johnston. What a monster he yeah. has turned into. The Wild need players like that to be injected into this lineup. Um, second line wing in the combination of Matt Zuccarello and Marco Rossi has been a real point of contention for me. 
in that it just Marcus Johansson occupied that spot for a good portion of the season, but it feels like he was just a placeholder there. I think you could insert pretty much any player into that spot and get 20 goals just by default. And he ended up with 11 on the season and six of those were, uh, or one of those was on the power play. So 10 even strength goals from a second line guy, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And so we, you've got, prospects like Liam Ogren, you've got Danila Yurov, you've got Riley Heights that are going to be making this team over the next few years. It really feels like a situation with this Minnesota Wild team is, you know, they're pretty limited right now in terms of being able to compete for a playoff spot, but over the next couple of years as these players get accustomed to the lineup, they're good enough that I think this Wild team has some real good upside mm -hmm. um to add pieces around Kirill and uh, to just further that mix, it's just a matter of getting them there. We're in that, like I said, we're in kind of that transition where once you get those guys into the lineup, then some of these questions will be answered. And then you get to the point where you can really start to pinpoint exact areas that need to be improved. And so we're in just this like middle ground. We're in like the waiting room in the yeah. lobby of the, uh, <laughs> of the doctor's office or wherever, just waiting for the number to be called. And so the wilds can expedite that process a little bit, or they, uh, they opt on the side of caution and, you know, you continue to see what we've seen play out over these, uh, these last couple of years. Yeah. Get off to a better start. <laughs> those those first 20 games are very, very important. If, if, if they get off to a, a better start, who knows what will happen. And the Central will be interesting because there obviously is a lot of te uh, good team. I mean, the West, too. You got to think about, you know, the wild card positions. Could Vegas sort of fall back at some other teams fall back? And, you know, Minnesota sort of is that that next team up and uh, maybe can uh, find themselves back into um the, the uh, playoff conversation. Speaking of the uh, central division, I, I do have a few more questions with you about the Minnesota wild. So I'll do that on the other side too, but we'll talk about the gauntlet at the central and West is every single year and uh, where we see the, the wild and stars uh, finishing at the end of next season. We'll do that in just a moment. So my lingering Minnesota wild question I still have goaltending was a bit of an issue at the beginning uh, of of last season especially with Flurry and Gustafson but those aren't the two I want to I want to talk about I want to talk about well well a, a bit <laughs> sure um I don't think I don't think the the wild did him many favors making his debut in Dallas <laughs> when, when the stars uh walloped them but but he came back if, if I'm not mistaken and and, and had a, a bit better finish uh, to the season, but what do you what do you make out of him? Uh, do you still think of him as he's going to be your future number one netminder? No, Nashville is also dealing with a, a a bit of this in this farm system. I think he's still a great prospect, but I'd love to to know a bit more about um, about him after that uh, after that game in, in Dallas because that was that was not very pretty for his sake and not much of his fault either. No, that was just <laughs> that was a like perfect storm bad scenario. Um, there were injuries in the lineup and, you know, it, it just felt like if they would have played him the game before, yes, it would have been a like a fundamentally different conversation that we would have been having, um, about kind of where he's at, but he more than bounced back, uh, mm -hmm. in his next couple of starts, uh, had a shutout against, yes, I know it's the San Jose sharks, but it still counts as a shutout. So stars took them to the overtime like twice <laughs> <laughs> they're a weird they were a weird team this year <laughs> yes they, they i were. just i just could never figure them out it felt mm -hmm. like they could have it felt like they should have been way worse than they were but at some points it's like uh, how how can you be this bad but um yes we're bounced back he had the the shutout against the um i think it was the chicago blackhawks uh now that i think of it but he still uh, he still performed really well, and he still is the future guy for this Minnesota Wild franchise. They're just in an odd spot with their goalie situation because yeah. he brought back Mark Andre Fleury for one more season, and um, 
I don't know. That would not have been my preference either. I mean, it we're we're getting a pretty clear picture as to why I'm sitting here and I'm not in the GM's chair for this <laughs> team. But it just felt like the way to go for this team was Philip Gustafson and Jesper Volstead as your goalie tandem for this upcoming season because Gus is still a young guy. He is two, he is a year removed from being one of the best goalies in the league. I think the league just got a little bit of a book on him this past season. And now it's on him to make the adjustments to uh, to try to get back to that level previously. But the Wild want to give Jesper the opportunity to be mentored by Marc-Andre Fleury for yeah. a full season, to pick his brain after every start, to see his process, because Marc-Andre Fleury has been a goalie for a very long time in this league. He has yes, had he some has. incredible seasons as a netminder. He has also had some seasons in which he has had to overcome a good deal of adversity. And so the wild want to have Jesper mentor him, but I feel like there may have been a little different way to go about that than putting your, uh, putting another young goalie just on the block to make a, uh, make a move now to the wilds credit. They haven't made that move yet, but it just feels like writing on the wall. It's coming because, are you really going to send Jesper to Iowa for another season? Is he going to get anything out of that? Yeah. Feels like a no from me to that answer uh, to answer that question. But it's we're in this weird spot where it feels like there are a few things that need to be fleshed out. The season will be uh, getting going in October. And so do you do that here to before the end of August? Do you do that in August? Yeah. I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have to wait and see. That seems to to be what uh, <laughs> the the kind of system is here at this time at the end of July. <laughs> we'll just uh, yeah. we'll wait and see. Training camp will get rolling, and then uh, a lot of things will uh, start to to figure themselves out. I did ask this to to one of my guests a few weeks ago. I want to ask it to you as well. You look at the eight teams that that made the the playoffs in the in the Western Conference last year: Dallas, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Colorado, Edmonton, Nashville. LA and then Vegas, who was not an eighth seed, by the way. Um, <laughs> out of those teams, who misses the playoffs next season? Who do you Ooh. think jumps in? I so I'll I'll start with who jumps in because it feels like it's got to be Nashville. It feels okay. like it's got to be them to uh, to hop mm -hmm. in at this point. Um, honestly, just because of the way that they are kind of trending, I am going to say that the Los Angeles Kings are the team. And I should, uh, I should have looked at this before I said that because Nashville did make the postseason last year. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I feel like the Los Angeles Kings are the team that is really on the bubble here mm -hmm. to potentially miss the postseason. But it's interesting because you look at the other teams that didn't. St. Louis very clearly transitioning towards yeah. kind of a rebuild. Calgary's in one. Seattle is hoping that they have a much better season this year. Utah. Could be interesting. Another Utah. aggressive team. <laughs> Utah. Well, I'm going to use a football term that yeah. um, one of my favorite football analysts used to talk about teams that could make the postseason if a lot enough things go right possibly frisky yes so yes. <laughs> utah is possibly frisky and then anaheim chicago san jose of yeah. those three it feels like chicago is the closest but still probably a little far away and so it, it feels it feels like that top eight is pretty set that's that's what i kind of got out of it but at the same time and this guest pointed back to me it's more about who's going to regress probably yeah. than who's going to make the jump up. Right. Yep. And that's the thing. And you know, if, if even, even St. Louis uh, they're going through a weird period, but they were only missed by six points. Um, I mean, there, there's not much of a worry about them maybe competing Minnesota again as a team. Um, I don't really see Calgary being um, in, in that mix, but yeah, that's kind of what I came out. Man, it feels like the, the same eight, <laughs> again, yeah. but uh, it, it, probably a team will regress. And I think LA could be that and Vegas too. It was for the first kind of free agency period. They just kind of stood pat, which was, which is really interesting. And maybe some of those crazy deals and constantly going for it, maybe kept, caught up to them a bit and maybe they have a, a bit of a down year, but at the same time, 
who knows? <laughs> it, it, it really is. It really is stacked there. But I mean, you look at the top of the division and I mean, most of those teams you would think are, are going to to stay there like yeah. the Dallas and Colorado and Winnipeg. So uh, I, I think when you look at teams like the wild and, and blues, can you sneak into that seven um, or eight spot? But as you alluded to earlier, you have to beat those playoff teams a bit. You got to beat those playoff teams. And the stars are a bit in that boat too. They had to beat the Colorado and Winnipeg's of the world, albeit for very different reasons. But if yep. they wanted to win the central, if they wanted to win the West and get home ice advantage, which doesn't even matter because Pete DeBoer can't win game one at home, but um, I digress. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. It's, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out because mm -hmm. of those teams that could potentially jump up, how aggressive are you? If you have a lot of things go right this season, like how much do you take advantage of that? Because you hit it right on the head. I feel like it's more likely that one of those top eights just has nothing go right to where they fall out of it. And you've got somebody maybe rising above them to take a spot. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fascinating because I feel like there still are a bunch of things that need to be resolved for a great handful of teams. And so do we get a busy August? I would be fine with that, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it just, it feels like there is a lot that still needs to be resolved before the season gets going. It'll be, um, it'll be a lot of fun to watch it unfold. This past NHL season was, uh, was a good one. It yeah. was, uh, it was, it was, it was really good in the grand scheme of things. So hopefully um, the, uh, the sequel can be uh, just as good. Well, Seth always, a pleasure to hop on with you. It's been a lot of fun getting to do these uh, over the past couple of years. Please share with the audience where they can find you and your wonderful, wonderful Locked On Wild show. And um, yeah, shout yourself out a little bit and share your platforms. You can just search <laughs> Locked On Wild. And, you know, we had grand designs on doing like prospect week this week, taking a mm -hmm. look at the organization, prospects to watch, stuff like that. But with Dean Evison getting hired in Columbus <laughs> yeah. and uh, a couple of other crossovers being lined up, it's turned more into crossover week, which yeah. hey, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. And it's just about at this point, just kind of starting to switch the message to this upcoming season, as opposed to kind of looking back or yeah. looking way ahead. August is when we're going to start to finally get full steam into like, okay, 2024, 2025 is coming. So yeah. listeners can, uh, can tune in for everything that we have to offer. Nice part is all the socials are just at lockdown wild. So nice and easy for you to, mm -hmm. uh, to find them all. But, uh, we just continue to, uh, to roll through the hits here, uh, as we move towards the end of the month of July. Absolutely. Well, be sure to sauce me and Seth a uh, subscribe on Locked on Wild, Locked on Stars. Well, hit that like button, hit that notification bell as well. Never miss an episode of Locked on Stars or Locked on Wild. Shout out to all you everydayers out there that are rocking along with us this off season. We're trying to keep it fresh, trying to keep it entertaining. It can be a, <laughs> it can be a bit wonky sometimes, but these crossovers have been fun. It's sort of been a crossover week as well. We had uh, Ann over at Locked on Preds, so uh, a lot of fun. And the more we can do this um, as uh, as shows, I think um, the better. I think it keeps uh, everybody. Keeps everybody on their toes. Well, that'll do it for this crossover episode of Locked on Stars, Locked on Wild. You can find us on our respective shows tomorrow. Until then, so long, everybody.